We are in Psalm 84, and I'd like to direct our attention before we pray to verse 10, where the Word of God says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Now, as you think about uh, the people of God, whether it be Israel or the church here in the New Testament, uh, we always tend to think about the negative aspects of society around us, right? For example, when Israel was a fledgling nation and they were in the incubator called Egypt, what happened? Uh, what happened to them and, and to their beginning? Who, who opposed them? It was Pharaoh. And what did God do to show that he was not pleased with Pharaoh? Well, he, he brought plagues, right? And these were forms of judgment against uh, a people that looked to a false god. Well, actually, many false gods. But they were kind of epitomized in this Pharaoh. But the Pharaoh really was a god himself, right? He set himself up as a god. And he didn't mind all of these lesser gods that were in Egypt as long as he could rule. It's once Moses got up and said there is only one god and he's the one that rules. That's when the trouble came. And so it's not so much... Um, I, I don't, you know, God says that he has not come into the world to judge the world or to condemn the world, but to save it. And so we look at the plagues and we say, why? But, but what about the Red Sea? And what about the converse? Look at Israel. Look at how God delivered that people. And it's the same with us, too. It's not the idea, okay, here's the judgment. Uh, this is what's going to happen to you if you don't get right with God. It's more like we should be living our lives in such a way that people want what we have. And I think we're missing that in the way that we live our lives often. I'm not saying that's true of everyone, but I know that it's true f for me from time to time. Well, I think that's the spirit here of Psalm 84. If you wanted to look carefully for a universal principle in verse 10, you might be tempted to say, well, you better, you better get into the uh, house of God. But that's not really what the text is teaching us. Uh, the text is an either or proposition, but he's saying here, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. In other words, I'd rather be a man who serves the Lord than a man who, who serves the world. He says, I, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. And so that's the either or proposition that he gives. He's saying, you either go to the world for a, a source of fulfillment and you'll never find it, or you come to God who is the only source of fulfillment, who is the only source of blessing. Now last week when we were looking at this psalm, I mentioned that the key ingredient here for us is the presence of God, and here it is again. It's not so much a tabernacle or a church or a building, but it's God's presence that the psalmist is consumed with. Remember what verse 1 says, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. So even, even I, I, I even envy the birds who nest within your tabernacle, he, he will mention in the psalm. And so it's about God's presence. It's not about, it's not about the building. So a day in your courts is better than a thousand. Well, that's about my position. I'm close to God. That's what the tabernacle represents. That's what the courts of God represent. And that's what it should represent for us as we read this psalm. It's God's presence, the fact that he is near. And whatever God chooses for me, that truly is the best. And I would say as we go to prayer um, this evening that there are three reasons that this is true. And maybe this will help us to pray right tonight. The first reason is there's nothing more honorable than serving God. The second reason is there's nothing more joyful than serving God. And the third reason is there's nothing more rewarding than serving God. It's more honorable to serve God than to uh, really truly rise above it all, as they say in the world um, if I have a, a position in the world, then that position 
may be one of authority, but there can only be one person that truly occupies the throne, and that one person is God. All kinds of authority out there in the world. But we know that it waxes and wanes. We know that the, the people think that they are in charge, but they're not face to face with reality. And that's why we, we have chosen the best part by coming together to pray tonight. We've chosen to come to the true throne where we will obtain mercy and find grace to help right now in this present time in which we live. And so imagine a man that was as powerful as the President of the United States who was a billionaire and he had no real care. He had no real burden. All of those things combined. Even if there were such a man, and I highly doubt there is, uh, then which position would be more honorable? To have that man's position or to be a doorkeeper at the threshold of God's presence? And I think the answer is clear. I mean, when we're in our right minds thinking, we'd say, yeah, I'd rather be at, in the, at the threshold of God's presence, be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to have even that kind of a position and that kind of money. But the, the fact that we're a Christian and the fact that we understand that nothing could compare to that, well, how does that, how does that equate to honor? Well, our honor is found in the fact that when we gather here and we pray, God condescends from his throne to hear us and to answer our prayer. That's where our honor is found. There's nothing more honorable than that. Secondly, there's nothing more joyful. There are many wonderful joys that are evident in our lives. The joy that, that Terry described even tonight is a blessing. Um, there are many joys that we just have as we go through life, but we recognize that they're transitory. I mean, we know that Everything gets old, everything loses its luster, the thrill is gone in no time. I mean, we recognize that if we've lived for any length of time. I mean, when we're young and we're idealistic, we always think that there will be something better. And if there was a certain scenario or a certain circumstance and it all lined up, then I would truly be happy. But if it is, if it is a horizontal uh, ambition, if it is a horizontal desire, then it will never satisfy. That's the... That's the truth. And so there's nothing really more joyful than to realize that when God allows these pleasures to come into our lives, and he does, and, and they stir us, they stir our emotions, we have to remember that they're supposed to provoke us to give thanks to him because he provided them. And I think that that's where we should be, but sometimes we look at that as being the end as rather than part of the, the joy that God brings into our lives because we keep our eyes on him. And we have to be very careful that we don't slip into this temporal mindset that most people have and we live for things or positions. Uh, because those may bring temporary joy, but then the joy is gone, the thrill is gone. And we have to be very careful about that. There's nothing more joyful than living in God's presence. And if God should happen to bring certain blessings or withhold certain blessings, as long as he is here with me, that is fine. And that's the kind of mindset that we need to have. And then third, there's nothing more rewarding. You know, life can be very rewarding. If you work really hard, then you're going to realize a goal. Um, if you uh, work hard with your children and you train them and you discipline them, and they grow up more, more often than not, they're going to grow up to... Uh, be a blessing throughout your older years. You have grandchildren, families, and all kinds of blessings. But those rewards are really nice. But really, when you boil everything down in this temporal world, we're supposed to be content even if we don't have the children and the grandchildren, even if we don't have the positions or the cars. It, it, we're supposed to be content, according to the Lord Jesus, as long as we have food and raiment. And really, that's all that we need. And if you boil everything down, that's all that people really have. They don't have anything else. The rest is just kind of icing on the cake. But we've kind of gotten into a mindset where we kind of expect certain things. We feel entitled to certain things. And when we don't get them, 
then we feel disappointed and dejected, but nothing should really be more important than the reward of God's presence. So whatever tries to steal that away, okay, that's really our enemy. It's not the things. It's whatever is robbing the reward of his presence in our lives. I think it's a choice that we make, this position. It's a position in the world or it's a position before God at the threshold. And we make that choice every day. If we make the right choice, then you know what's going to happen? We're going to question our wisdom somewhere along the line. We're going to be sitting here in a prayer meeting and we're going to say, you know, why am I here and I'm not out there? Why am I at this particular point in my life and not at a different point in my life? Those are the questions that we're going to ask ourselves. We are actually going to say, are we too heavenly minded to be any earthly good? When in fact, nobody is that way. It's not that we're too heavenly minded. It's we never think about heaven. We, we never think about God. And that's our problem. We've made the right decision by coming here. We've made the right choice. And so there are many people, though, that have made the right decision before us, right? There are this great cloud of witnesses that Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 talks about. Uh, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, right? So there is this great cloud of witnesses that are around us. They've come before us and they've walked the path and you could almost hear them rooting us on to keep moving forward in our relationship with God. And as long as we have him present and close with us, nothing else will matter. Um, there are many that have made the wrong decision, right? There are people that make the wrong decision. We see them. We try to help them, but they don't want the most basic help. For example, why don't we get together and pray once a week? Why don't I keep you accountable and reading your Bible and praying each day? Okay, people don't want that help. They don't think it's practical. They don't think it's helpful at all. And yet we see it changing us and transforming us and giving us the discernment to make the right choices daily. And so God puts us in a certain place where we are rewarded. And they want that. But they want a magic elixir to get there. See, they don't want to do the work. You know, you say, well, do we really do work in our relationship with God? We do. I mean, prayer is work. Reading your Bible is work, right? Spending, spending the Wednesday evening praying together. Okay. Those are the things that God wants us to do. I and mean, many people are making the wrong decisions. Um, I think that when the journey is over, there will be many that will greet us and they will affirm that we indeed made the right choices. And I think that in that day, we will be very grateful. So let me just encourage us as we pray together this evening, don't examine yourself by what you do. But rather, look at what the psalmist has said here. Examine yourself by what you delight in. That will give you an accurate gauge of where you are in your relationship with God. What is it that is your delight? What makes you happy? It says in Romans 8, 5, that those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Allow the world and all of the things that are enticing about the world, allow that to fade. And allow Christ to become dominant in your life because our citizenship is not here. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Philippians 3.20 says. Paul goes on to say that he will transform our body and conform it into his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. And 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that he will be all in all in the end. And all the things that we really, really thought that were important, we won't even remember those things. For a day in your court, all right, is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in tents of wickedness. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here together. We pray for your blessing over our prayer time. Help us to realize that what we do when we pray together is truly valuable. And I ask, Lord, that 
we'd share more testimonies and that we'd have more opportunities to pray together and that you would answer our very specific requests before you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.